it's there and something you can use. If it's something you don't know, but you know that you don't know it, that's a known unknown. That's something you can go and find out later if you need to. That's all good. If you don't know it and you don't know that you don't know it, then it's an unknown unknown and that's something that might come to bind you later on. But there's a row missing from this. What happens if you know something but you don't know that you know it? Uh, Gary defined that as ideology. Um, and I think that's a pretty good definition, but um, tradition, I think, is also somewhat appropriate there. It's something where it's the kind of background radiation and it's something that you just use without really questioning it. And so, to get started, let's... So, I work, I work for a company that makes a lot of USB devices. Um, one of our USB devices, which is not the key that you've got in your things, it's a, hierarchy, it's a sorry, hardware storage module, um, involves a piece of software we call the connector and it talks to it over USB. Um, and I was wanting to rewrite that in Rust, because you do. Um, and the problem was that at the time, the USB bindings for Rust were somewhat hit rocket. And so I decided to try and implement just enough of what the USB did in Rust itself on the three platforms that we cared about, which were Windows, Mac, and Linux. And basically, I just wanted to implement this. I want to iterate over USB devices to find a device that matches a given vendor product people. Um, I want to get the device's serial number because sometimes you want to have more than one attached. You want to make sure you're attached to the right one. I want to open the device and claim it to zero. The device is going to be locked in. It doesn't matter. Send an echo request packet and get the response back. All good. So here, in fairly quick terms, because otherwise I'm going to blow my entire runtime on just this, is what that code looks like without any error checking or anything. Do not run this code. Windows. We start by getting a, a class device thing, uh, we enumerate, we create a numerator for it, we get some devices, we get interface detail, not once but twice because the first time we're just trying to get a byte count, so we do it again. Um, once we've got that, then we have a device part. This is not a file system part, this is a device part. This is not slash dev slash something or the Windows equivalent, it's like the device tree part that you get. So that's all good. Then we open that, we create file W, the W means wide or windows or something, it means not ASCII. Um, and that's about the only actual file operation you'll see in this whole thing, because we rapidly move on to the USB API, which is the, US, the API for talking with USB devices from user space in Windows. So we create an interface handle, we get uh, the device descriptor, which gives us the vendor and product things that we need in order to be able to tell whether we've got the right one. Then we get a string descriptor, this 409 value is one you'll see a lot, that is USB speak for English. Um, so we're getting the English serial number, not any of the other fancy serial numbers. Um, then we make sure it's the one we want, this is actually used to get 16 for reasons, but whatever. So, now we've got the device we want, we do a bunch of mucking around the setting pipe policies, pipes are the things we need to be with the USB device. Uh, this one tells it that we want it to send zero link packets when necessary. This one and this one are all about just clearing the pipe to make sure that it's not going to fail on us, and then we can write data to it and read data from it. So that's not so bad. Like, I was actually pleasantly surprised by this, because it's not too bad. You've got a bit of the start where you are doing the device iteration and finding the device you're looking for, and then you've got the actual USB stuff on the other side, and that's, you know, it all flowed together pretty well. So, Matt. We start by creating a dictionary, that's, uh, which is used to matching devices, which tells want to match USB devices. Um, then we go and find all the matching services, the services they think that will to a device. We iterate over these. And then we create plug -in interface for service. This returns us an object that you can <coughs> communicate with the device. This is a COM object, as in component object model. I'm not making that up. But uh, it's for a good reason, because it lets the version the interface. You'll notice just above the bit I've highlighted, it says KIO USB device interface ID 650. That means version 650, which pertains to Mac OS 10 point something I can't remember. Um, so we have to call here interface, which is com speak for actually I want this class, not the one you gave me. At which point we don't need it anymore, and we can go on and do something else with it. Um, so now that we've got our device, we can call get device vendor and get device product. That lets us find where we've got the one we want. Um, then we can call get USB get serial number string index, which tells us where in the string table the thing is, and then we have to construct an actual request structure in order to get it, which we then send. 
You'll notice that this is a lot of low speed structure function calling here at all time. Can we make sure we got the right one? And then the, the, the next fun part is we have to face interface iterate because we have to iterate over the interfaces that the device is giving us. So this is another one of IO kit iterators, so we're calling IO iterator next again. That instruction is merely uh, tell me what interface number you are so that I can check it. Um, and then we get another one. So this time instead of getting a USB device interface, we're getting a USB interface interface. Factory. Um, again, we have a few versions. This all actually won't do that. And then we can open the interface, and then I'm going to gloss over a bit, which is the fact that um, uh, Mac OS uses pipe indexes, and you have to work out whether it's the pipe one you actually want. Um, but you just call write pipe and read pipe, and the TO means that you're reading this right now. That's all fine. These are all, if you actually go digging through the USB, you will see all of this code with actual error checking and stuff. So use that code on my code. So, how about Linux? We start with UDEV. UDEV is not too bad. UDEV new, UDEV enumerate new, we're, you know, we're creating an enumerator. We're telling it we want USB devices. We're scanning devices, we get a list. We iterate through the list. We get a name, which gives us a path. And then we created the UDEV device from that path. And then we get a bunch of things, bus number, get adder, and sys name. Okay, now what? SMP. So we have to get to the file that contains the descriptors and then read the descriptor in, at which point we can say whether we've got the right vendor and product people. SMP. So now we've got the actual device. device. Um, and at that point, the developers of this gave up on everything being a file and just made you write out all the structures that I offer. <laughs> but now we've got the serial number, so that's okay. And then another I optal. And so that's the plain interface, that's the blue white one. And then read and write you the guest that I optal. So, yeah. I'm not a fan. The, the, everything is a file mentality that they've used here. I don't think it's actually served them well at all. Um, the UDEV interface is quite nice, but as soon as I had to pivot to SM printf using the paths that I had to work out myself in order to actually work out where the device was, that, that didn't really work too well. But this is not the worst USB related or everything in the file API that's around. The USB function FS is used to create user space devices. So I wanted to test the code that I've written. That meant I needed a USB device that I had on a stick and could control and control where it bosses off. Linux has an answer for that. It's called the function FS API. Here's what you need to do. You have to make a magic directory. You have to make more magic directories. You have to echo random values into files that are magically created when you created those magic directories. You have to simulate one of your magic directories to another magic directory. You have to then make another magic directory and now the magic file system. Then you have to write a bunch of carefully constructed binary data, shove it into a file which then creates more devices, at which point you can open those, uh, those devices and start doing stuff with them, at which point you can be ca a magic value to put it on your system into another magic file and hopefully it connects.
Um, so one of the uh, Kingsgrove titles for this when I first started writing was Dave Cutler's Life. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Dave Cutler was originally with Jack and then with Microsoft Legends Dave with the operating system called Windows NT. And uh, he was not a fan of Linux. And especially not a fan of Linux's IO model, where he had to go cowardly, uh, where he still would say, got a bike, got a bike, got a bike, bike, bike. But anyway, so this is, this is the Linux IO. I API got like the guts of it. And this works reasonably well uh, when you think about it running on something like a Mac or a PDP or something like that. You're doing some data in your data app. It's really simple, everything's great. Then the internet happened. Well, more importantly, people discovered that shoveling data out of sockets and into sockets and into files and out of files in lots of different ways didn't really work with that API very well because it's blocking. The file descriptor in the image by default will block the read. The read call does not return until it's done its reading. When you write, it doesn't return until it's done its writing. And this slows you down. You can only do one thing at a time. But if you have an answer for that, that's fine. Um, we have the most delightfully named system calling the entire unit Campion, which I won't pronounce, <laughs> which we can use to set a flag that says you should block. At which point we can use the wonderful select API, which we set up in the 4.2 DFD and I can agree. Um, the problem with this one is that you have to shovel these FD sets, which are effectively large bit strings, one bit per file descriptor, into and out of the kernel. And they also have, you also have to know how big they are, which kind of limits how many file descriptors you can have. And that's great when you're talking small things, but because, you know, let's not forget, the next three days in the internet. And so, you know, that was okay, but it didn't work too well. Um, AT&T's response with this in SVR3 and 1986 from Pol. This fixes the file script with cat problem, but it means you still have to shovel large amounts of file script the records in and out of the kernel and, and do all that kind of stuff, so it still had the long limitations. And then we had a bit of a... And then FreeBSD, um, in 2000, invented this API, which is actually really good. It's a kernel event API. It, it's not just file script events, it's all kernel events. You can register to listen to any of them. Minimal backends, file descriptor events, file events, like, you know, this file got created, deleted, uh, processes executed, signals happened, all kinds of stuff. And of course, this was so, this was really good. It was used to make a whole bunch of nice high performance stuff on previous So of course, we're going to say, hell no, I'm not taking that. Um, Epol is okay, I guess, except it's very focused around file descriptors. And so if you want anything else to be an event, you have to create a file descriptor for it, because all events are part of the event. Anyway, um, but anyway, that's that's kind of beside the point. Now we have non-blocking I/O, and that's great. But the thing is, this I/O is still synchronous. Um, synchronous is different to blocking. Blocking means that you can't do anything else until you finish doing the first thing. Synchronous means you still have to wait for it to finish. It just might finish and say, "I couldn't do it right now." And this is really almost tying in with the Unix you know, process model, where a unit that processes memory. Like, it's not strictly sacrosanct, but it's, it's generally not good form for the kernel to go rummaging around in your memory a lot. And asynchrony would require that to be the case. You would have to be able to muck around in your pro the processor's memory and have memory that's shared between two things at once, and that's tricky. Now, it didn't stop POSIX from having a go. Hands up, this actually used this. 